Hi, everyone, and welcome to Decoded by Divers. I'm the host, Dina Matar, the CEO of Divers. Today we have Manel Sword, who was the VP at King and currently the CEO of Games for a Living. And we also have Trip Hawkins, who is the founder and the first CEO of Electronic Arts and currently the CSO of Games for a Living. Welcome, guys, and thank you so much for being here today. We're extremely honored to have you. I just want to give a quick shout out to entrepreneur.com. Thank you guys so much for hosting us. Um, Manel and Trip, it's 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 really great to have you here. Um, maybe you guys can start by giving us a bit of an introduction. Maybe Manel, you guys, you can give us a start. Um, tell us a little bit about you, your background, and then you know your experience in the traditional gaming industry and what brought you into the Web3 gaming world. Yeah, for sure, Dina. Thanks for hosting us today. So I started at the in, in the games industry. When games for me, it's always been a passion that I have since I was a kid i always liked games and i always kept uh i wanted to keep this like uh, peter pan kind of a spirit like for the wee age i keep a, a bit of me myself like thinking like like a kid and um i started my my professional career in games on the late in, in the late 90s uh um back then i was a, a developer i worked on pc games console games and then there was a point where i i decided to go back to spain uh, and the problem was that there was no industry here. So I had to drop my career as, a, as an engineer. The last project I worked on was I was the lead developer in PlayStation 2 for uh, Worms 3D Mayhem. And then I moved to, to Spain and, and had to move my career from developer to uh, entrepreneur. I joined a friend of mine who had a, a startup, uh, uh, was called Microshocks. Uh, the company uh, went through some difficult times uh, back then. But we uh, revamped it, and in a matter of a couple of years, uh, from 2005 to 2006, we we changed the whole thing from a company that was kind of dying to a company that they won won the second prize to the best game of the year with UEFA Champions League 2007, and that uh, fortunately for us triggered the attention of of Trip, uh, as as he'll explain later on. Um, that was with uh, Digital Chocolate. They decided to acquire us, and we had the privilege to work with him. Uh, I consider him the, the father of mobile gaming, as we as we know it today. And then we worked together. I specialized during that my time at Digital Chocolate at opening new markets. I, I had the opportunity to uh, try .com games, to try the first smartphone games, uh, to try Facebook games. We got several uh, hits uh, uh, on, on the different platforms. With, for example, Double Blocks Deluxe 3D on, on the iPhone. We got uh, Billionaire City, I think, is the most remarkable one, as it was uh, when we entered Facebook games and was the, the only company at that point to be in the top. You will see all Zynga games, but then uh, was Digital Chocolate in the middle with uh, Millionaire City. We kept doing a lot of games. And then there was a, a moment when I, I thought about Trip left uh, Digital Chocolate, and that affected my motivation there. So I decided to start a new startup. And that's when uh, the guys at, at King reached me out and say, uh, Manel, um, what about joining us? And I, uh, uh, I told them like initially, like it's not my thing to work for a big corporation. Like I, but they were not that big; they were like making sixty million dollars per year that back, back then. But I said like I like I'm an entrepreneur. I like to have my own space. And they told me like uh, that was with uh, Sebastian and, and Ricardo. And they said, look, look, don't don't worry. And Stefan Kurgan, they said like, don't worry, we're entrepreneurs as well. So we'll give you plenty of freedom. We'll fully empower you. And then you can set up a, a games studio where you feel like. And that's when uh, we started uh, uh, King Games Barcelona. Um, two years later, uh, the games created at that studio in Barcelona uh, were generating more than $1 million per day. So uh, we saw a lot of evolution with that. And then uh, we went through all the different phases. We had an IPO. Uh, we were acquired by Activision Blizzard. Uh, actually, the last project I worked on were two key projects. One was uh, a version of Call of Duty for mobile, uh, where we had the opportunity to work with the uh, Activision team. And also, I worked on a, uh, a technology that took three years. Uh, uh, we were working on a, on a model to optimize the games and measure uh, entertainment and be able to figure out how to improve the games further. Um, and we published part of that at the, uh, the Nature uh, magazine with, with an article uh, that we worked on for, for these three years with lots of very interesting conclusions about uh, gaming and how people get engaged in games and what makes games fun or not, things like that. Um, and then at, at that point, I I, I, I I felt like there was not much more to do in, in like 
games as we know them, like we went from uh, product games to free-to-play games to free-to-play uh, games as a service. And uh, it was very advanced, the model back then. Uh, so I decided to retire. Uh, then uh, uh, I, I had the COVID uh, a few years later, and, and I, 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 that made me reflect about my life. And I realized that uh, games were really important to me, so I decided to go back to gaming. And I also realized that my kids are really important to me, so I decided to have uh, another kid. And uh, that yeah. were a couple of key decisions. And when I decided to go back to gaming, I looked at the at the market, and I I, I felt like. Uh, Blockchain technology was something that was going to be big. Uh, back to, to the experiences I was mentioning, and one of the things uh, that I learned from, from Trip is that the world is always changing and you have to interpret it as, a, as, a, as an opportunity to, to change the status quo. Uh, and, and, and for me, blockchain was the best opportunity to, to do that. Of course, the market back then and still today, uh, it's far from being like mainstream. We, we, we went through the same with free-to-play games and with games themselves. I mean, when games came in, uh, people had a lot of issues with them, uh, saying that they're not good for uh, your kids and so forth. So that, that's overview of how we started Game for a Living. And, and the game name of the company actually expresses what we are after. And I think we're in a, in a good track. We're innovating a lot. We're not doing what you've seen in previous games. When you think about Web3 Gaming, we're doing something new with a new approach. Uh, bringing all our know-how, not only in core gameplay, but also in sustainable business models. So looking forward to see uh, what players think about our approach, uh, especially in March, when we're going to be releasing uh, the first main title, Elemental Riders, will be fully released as free-to-play and play to earn. Amazing. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. Now, Trip, everyone knows you as the founder and the first CEO of Electronic Arts, EA Sports. So can you please tell us a little bit about your background, um, your journey, how you started EA Sports and, you know, the other companies that you've been involved with? Um, yeah, maybe let's start there because there's there's a lot to go through here. Yeah, thanks, Dina. It's great to be here. You know, I go all the way back to my childhood when I noticed that my brain was on fire when I was playing and particularly when I was playing games where you know, I, had, I felt like I had some agency and you know, there was some kind of fantasy that uh, gave me some power. I'm, and I'm really just talking about card games, board games, you know, even just playing in the backyard and, you know, uh, acting out your fantasies. And I, I noticed that when I was watching television, I just felt dumber. And <clears throat> so I just started thinking about that. And this is stuff that has been proven by scientists now that the single best way to increase human intelligence is through interaction. And basically, play is interaction. And nowadays, of course, everybody's uh, got devices and they're interacting all the time. And we understand these concepts of uh, engagement and social connection. And you know, half the world, like me, <clears throat> is introverts. And introverts aren't really always sure how to start a conversation. So it's fantastic in social life for introverts if we have something to do together, like play a game. And his, these are just things that I <clears throat> kind of recognized when I was a kid. I, I noticed that um, some of the most sophisticated games that I felt created the most amazing experience, and I'm thinking now about inventions like Dungeons and Dragons, they're really hard to operate with uh, paper and dice and cards and charts. Mm -hmm. And uh, most, most of uh, the, the kids that um, I played these more challenging games with they would tend to prefer to wander off and watch television because it's so easy to use. You know, it's very passive, but you don't you don't realize that you're being kind of dumbed down. And I realized, well, you know, um, may, maybe there's a better way to do this to make it less complicated for people to play. And then I saw my first computer and realized, aha, this is the answer. <clears throat> We're going to put all this stuff <clears throat> inside the box and put pretty pictures on the screen like television. And we've now been working on that for 50 years, and I've been active in the game industry that whole time. And there have been many different technology cycles. I've been through all of them, you know, including you know the shift as we've gone from uh, you know uh, arcades to home computers to uh, internet to mobile devices, and uh, you know now it's finally uh, 
uh, doing what it uh, you know was always capable of uh, doing. You know, and early in my career, people would say to me, "So why do you think games are going to be such a big deal?" Around that time, Atari had just imploded, and mm -hmm. retailers were getting out of video games, and the news media was very negative. Like video games were a hula hoop that had failed and everyone was going to move on and it was just a one and done. <clears throat> and I would, and I, I got tired of being asked about why I thought there was a reason to care about video games. And I would just say in 50 years, everybody that doesn't play video games will be dead. <laughs> and here we are today. And there's now over 3 billion people playing games. And, you know, most of the demographic that's not playing games, they are aging and they are going to age, age out. And all of the new generations are digital natives. They practically come out of the womb holding a handset. We've got yeah. you know, over 10 billion devices that are hooked up on the internet. I mean, it's, it's really pervasive now. A lot of interesting issues and opportunities with that. And it's always been a lot of fun. Well, that's pretty, that's a long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. Um, do you mind maybe touching on also your time and, you know, working uh, with at Apple with Steve Jobs? I know that you've probably talked about this a lot, but um, obviously this is something I'm also interested in hearing about. What was that experience like? Yeah, well, uh, one of the things that uh, may surprise you is that I was working in a computer think tank as a summer job in college in 1975, mm -hmm. and I already knew I needed to learn about computers, and so I'm doing that. And then a colleague comes back from lunch, and he tells me he, would, he had just been in a store called the Computer Store in Santa Monica, California, and they, they were basically taking the uh, computer terminals, like the ones that we used at our office to talk to the mainframe. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, you can actually rent them and take them home, and they only cost $10 an hour to use. Wow. And, and I thought about that. I said, wow, OK, this is the start of consumer computing, computing in the home. How long is it going to take for enough computers to get into homes that I can start the game company I want to start, that which would become Electronic Arts? So this is in 1975. And uh, um, after my colleague uh, uh, wandered back to his office, I just grabbed a piece of notepaper and I started calculating how fast <laughs> I think computers would get into homes. And I decided in 1975 that I would start my company in 1982, that that would be the right wow. time to do it. And there were things that I wanted to do, like finish school. And I also wanted to uh, work in a computer hardware company that was selling computers into the home so that I could number one, learn how to run my own business, but also I wanted to get more machines in the home so that I can make the games for them. So that's why I wanted to work for a company like Apple and I had to kind of engineer it because I, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not an engineer myself. I'm more of a marketing person. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how do I get a job in Silicon Valley when they, you know, pretty much are all engineers? And I thought, okay, uh, I'm I'm going to figure out how I can write it, the first national uh, market research study about personal computers. And I, and I was able to do that. I found a market research firm and had to jump through a lot of hoops. But uh, I became the author of that study. And it gave me an, an excuse to be in contact with all these fledgling little companies. And, and when I was actually producing that uh, study, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Apple only had maybe 10 office workers. They were maybe making about wow. 100 hobby computers a month. And it was just a tiny little company in a tiny little industry. And but I was it by the because I wrote the study and got it on Apple's radar. Uh, one one day I'm at home and uh, my phone rings and it's Steve Jobs and he's berating me because uh, the marketing I was doing about the study through my uh, my research company that I was working for. Uh, the, 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 there was a a statement that I made about how um, Apple was misleading in their advertising because they claim to be the best selling a person computer, which is not even remotely close to being true. Radio Shack <laughs> selling a, a huge number of these TRS 80s known as the trash 80, not a great machine, but uh, Radio Shack had thousands of stores and a lower price. Anyway, uh, I had to hold the phone out for a while to until Steve calmed down. And then I started explaining to him 
what I said about Apple in the study and I read it to him and he was, he was very flattered because in fact, I was uh, quite taken with Apple and had a lot mm -hmm. of nice to say about them. And of course he knew that I knew the truth and I'm just reporting the truth. He just wasn't very happy about it because it made their ads look bad. <laughs> anyway, I told him, you know, this is a study that if you adjust for inflation today, that study would be about $5,000 in today's dollars. And if you're a little startup like Apple, you can't afford to buy it. The customers are generally, you know, uh, venture capital firms and you know, big investors and big corporations. But I, I said to Steve, look, uh, I'm actually looking for a job in the industry and uh, I'd be happy to come down and talk to you guys and I'll bring a copy of the study and you can look at it. You know, so I'm giving a, them a chance to have a, a free look at this five thousand dollar research uh, report. And they jumped on that like a live grenade. And <laughs> once I got down there. And, uh, they, you know, they realized, wow, uh, we need this guy. And so they, they uh, made me an offer. And I, I got plenty of other offers from other personal computer companies and decided, you know, I really think Apple's the right one. You know, th there were you know, certainly well over 50 early manufacturers of personal computers, but Apple's really the only survivor, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of really being in the market making, uh, you know, uh, products for humans to use. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, uh, I guess I had pretty good instincts about uh, ha how to pick them. And then I worked there for four years. And over that four year period, we went from this tiny little thing to a Fortune 500 public company doing a billion dollars a year in revenue with 4,000 employees. And I was always yeah. working with the founders. And in fact, when I started Electronic Arts, Waz uh, became a board member and was a really fantastic uh, colleague you have involved for the first uh, three or four years at EA. And there, there was some real great talent leading Apple, and, and they were a, a lot of fun to work with. You know, Steve deserves his bad reputation. Uh, he liked to blow people <laughs> up. But what was interesting about him is that he dropped out of school really early and mm -hmm. wasn't really a big reader. So the way Steve learned was through debate with people. And he needed to have people like me around that were good at doing that with him and that could help him learn things. You know, it's like you're having a Socratic dialogue, basically trying to figure out interesting questions and problems. And if he if he decided that he needed you and he respected your intellect, then you got to be in his uh, inner circle. And and I, I saw how he kind of uh, decided who was in and who was out uh, and. You know, basically, you got treated a lot better if you were in the, you know, inner circle. <laughs> and we had a lot of fun together because we were both, uh, you know, in our early 20s at that time. And we hung out a lot personally and had a lot of uh, very personal conversations. And and then he was really infuriated uh, when I left. Uh, but, I, you, know, I, you know, the calendar rolled around. It was 1982. Uh, the game industry was, you know, really actually a thing already. And I was actually feeling like I was kind of late. And that's when I left to start Electronic mm -hmm. Arts. Yeah, he was not very pleased. <laughs> well, to be fair, that sounds honestly like an incredible experience. Out of all the offers, I'm sure, coming back now, you can see that Apple was probably the right choice, especially Indeed. considering you know where we are today. Everyone's using MacBooks. I'm using one right now. Um, so I'm sure you guys are also using Apple products. Yeah, I think it's right just a part of everyone's everyday. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've got my everyone. Everyone's just living off it now. You know, and just to make so a quick good, comment about good. electronic arts, uh, when I started mm -hmm. EA, I counted up, you know, because I'm sort of a natural researcher. So I counted up all the companies that were making like cartridges for products like the early Atari and the uh, fledgling uh, computer game companies that were making games for the Apple II and the Commodore, uh, Commodore uh, Pat and you know, various other early PCs. And, and uh, you know, we'd already had a couple of uh, the first uh, West Coast computer fairs where there were conferences where these little companies could go show you their stuff. And that was all happening kind of in my backyard. So I was able to make a list of 135 competitors to EA when we started. And uh, basically, um, Activision existed, but they went they went out of business uh, mm -hmm. a few years later, and so there, there was an early Activision, and then uh, Bobby Kotick uh, basically bought some of the assets, including the the name, out of bankruptcy and restarted it. 
But out of those 135, none of them are still around as independent companies. The only one that made it, you know, Apple was the only one that made it in their group. EA was the only one that made it in their group of 136, you know? Uh, so pretty yeah. remarkable when I, when I look back on it. And of course, you know, I've, I've uh, had plenty of business projects that haven't worked out. I mean, nobody hits a home run in every swing and you got to roll with the punches. But, mm -hmm. you know, this is what's so great about innovation and technology is that there's always ways to improve it. There's always ways to disrupt what's going on. There's always ways to make things better. And that's that's what we're trying to do with Games for a Living. That's amazing. Well, maybe you guys can tell us a little bit about, you know, how it was working together with uh, Digital Chocolate and then how you both got into the Web3 space. So basically how you went from that to, you know, doing your own things and then coming back together and creating Games for a Living. Maybe, Manel, you want to you wanna give us a... Sure. Yeah. On, on, on my end, uh, the experience of working with Trip was very unique. I mean, when he tells you about these stories, I remember like lots of them, like like when the mouse was invented, when the scroll was, where they had to decide whether the scroll went down, moved in one way or another. Yeah. Uh, when they were creating the icons and all these things that was so inspiring, and especially like I, I, I was from Spain and I had been in the UK. Uh, but our vision here was very close, was more like when you're at school uh, in, in Spain, uh, teachers were telling you, like, we know everything about the world uh, and <laughs> we were about, uh, about how the world works. And and then working with uh, uh, all of the time with Trip, it was a completely different experience. It was like, no, the world is all to be invented. And, and it will, I mean, you are here today and whenever, like 50 years later, I mean, whatever it's there, it's going to be completely different to what you have today. And that opened like just so many things and uh, a number of creativity and also the the, the um, uh, I think it's very important the lack of fear or, or on failure like let's try this let's try that um, that's how innovation comes in also that's how you build your uh, uh, your knowledge by trying things and, and, and being bold sometimes and and trying to open new markets you know like I, I always um, uh, I realized that that Trip sees the market as like like 20 years from now. Like uh, he, he sees many of the things that he may be saying today that actually are going to happen, but people don't really see that they are going to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. and then when I when I was listening to him talking, I was always thought like, okay, that is going to happen sometime. So I better take advantage about all these ideas and apply. <laughs> and I, I mean, because that was very well relevant on many of the things we did, um, and I did also later on at King. I was reusing many of the concepts that Trip had uh, told us uh, back in the time, like things from 2006, I was using them in about 2016, 17, you know, like that was, that was, that was great. So uh, for me, it was always like a, a, an amazing experience. I, I always felt really fortunate uh, to having had the opportunity to work with him. I think, as I mentioned, like if you look at the top uh, uh, people in the games industry, a lot of, uh, in the top companies right now in mobile, a lot of them, uh, a lot of those people work or had something to do with trip and that's mm -hmm. for a coincidence i can tell you that there is a reason maybe recognize or not but <laughs> i, I, I believe that. it is, yeah. well you know from yeah. my point of view i'll just say that you know manel is a, a a really great human being and it's you know he's just a good guy and so he's a pleasure to work with i mean not not every colleague or every employee is uh you know a uh, necessarily easy to work with or all that smart or all that disciplined. You know, again, Manel, Manel's the kind of person that has has all of the right stuff uh, to make him a really fantastic leader and a great colleague. And, you know, when I, when we first met, you know, I could tell, uh, yeah, this guy's really got a lot of talent and he's going to, he's going to go far. He's, he's, he's going to uh, grow and, and, uh, you know, be a leader and be in management and, so of course I've uh, enjoyed watching over the last uh, several years, you know, just how he's he's progressed in his own career. But what I noticed immediately in the beginning uh, with Manel is uh, he's an incredible technical mind, and he's a very uh, innovative thinker. And so he just always had a leading edge or bleeding edge uh, ideas about what the next step needed to be and how to do it. And you know was uh, doing an awesome job at recruiting, organizing, and managing a team of really talented uh, technical people. And 
Again, those are very special people uh, in any media industry because that's really you know where, where all the good stuff uh, is going to come from. And you know, he and I shared this very early interest in uh, you know not just free to play, but free to play games that have virtual goods economies. And mm -hmm. that's just something that has been uh, a really fascinating subject for me for quite a long time, and for Mel Manel also. And I noticed when we were collaborating, particularly on Millionaire City, that uh, he was making breakthrough observations and had breakthrough ideas about the right way to do it. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, just these uh, ideas that were clearly going to be industry leading uh, ideas and insights about, say, the best practices, the right way to do these kinds of games that operate this way. And it was an industry struggle. I mean, you know, pretty much over the last 15 years, uh, there's been a real struggle for the industry. And there have been some very big successes, you know, uh, several you know, multi-billion dollar games that are free to play with virtual goods. But um, uh, mostly, uh, you know, heck, uh, only about one out of every, every one out of every thousand mobile games that launches in the app store ends up making a profit. I mean, it's a really, really tough uh, space. And it's not just the case in mobile. It's also true, you know, on the on the Internet as a whole, on the PC and so on. And, you know, basically it's taken us all this time to really understand as an industry what these best practices are. What's the right way to make these games so that it's a win win because you want the, the customers to feel like they're winning. And then you also need to make money in order to survive as a game company. And th this mm -hmm. is where Web3 shows up and it's like, oh, my God, this is such an improvement. This is such a better way to do virtual goods economies and, you know, to be a, a, a collaborative aspect of free to play. And it's, cl and it's clearly the gateway to the metaverse. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, this is just an incredibly juicy, exciting uh, thing to be working on. Yeah. Well, I mean, you say that and I completely agree, but you know, there's a lot of negative connotations for, I mean, you both have been involved in the traditional gaming industry for, I mean, like decades, you know? So what, what is your take on that? So like, what is your opinion in terms of, you know, everyone in the traditional gaming world where you guys have been so heavily involved has such a negative connotation on Web3 gaming. I mean, when it comes to the NFTs, like they're, they're, the way that they see it is like they, they say such negative things about it. They don't believe in them at all. And then, you know, that that's a big part of Web3 gaming, whether it's free to play or play to earn. Um, a lot of these, you know, Web3 games, they incorporate these NFTs and whether they're really powerful and they have really strong utilities in, you know, whatever category of, web3 they come out in every like every traditional gamer when it comes to the gaming side of things they have such a negative idea of that the minute that you know they say there's an nft involved they're just they just refuse to look any further so being so um you know like such pioneers in web2 gaming and traditional gaming what do you guys see of that like what do you make of that do you think that this is something that can change later down the line if so how do you think it will you know what do you think it will take to change all these minds into think to actually accepting nfts as something that is not just an nft but also a digital asset that will you know add value in the long run to well, that whether it's wanna, financial yeah yeah i just want to jump in and say that uh, man just about every major breakthrough in human history has been laughed at in its first yeah. days. And, you know, it's, it's just because when you're doing something for the first time and you're in the earliest part of figuring out a new technology, you need to build projects mm -hmm. and uh, try to explore uh, tangible ideas. But what you're really doing is prototyping. And what, what any good engineer will tell you is that prototypes are meant to be thrown away. You know, you're, you're, you're making something and it's helping you understand what it is you really need to be doing. And you do some testing and they're okay, now we've learned what we really need to do. It's a little like saying, okay, well, let's go build a model of a building and let's build it out of uh, balsa wood. Well, you're not going to be able to build any kind of a meaningful building that way, but that's a way to mm -hmm. explore how you're going to do the building. And then maybe you're going to build a real building, but you're going to build it out of wood. But that's not going to be a, a material 
that you can build a 300 story building with. <laughs> you know, if you're going to build the Burj, uh, you know, you, you're going to have to go way down underground. You're going to have to have all the, this amazing foundation and, uh, you know, use uh, all kinds of steel and, you know, other really modern stuff. So it takes a while for any new technology to go through those uh, steps. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you go look at the first generation of NFTs, just a lot of it was garbage. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, the most important NFT is the smart contract and the, the ability to do something really brilliant and creative and valuable with the capabilities of that smart contract. And it is really simple minded, passive NFT things like 2D art. OK, that's a mm -hmm. prototype. That's a good thing to practice with. But. That's not the end game for something like Web3. And if you're just going to do that, you're going to have some speculators and you're going to have plenty of scams and it's not going to be very interesting. But, it, you know, so it gave everything a bad name. I remember a year ago, I was talking to a very notable venture capitalist from a very successful firm that mm -hmm. has done a lot in games and a lot in Web3. And I asked him about their deal flow. And by the way, this is before the crypto crash. And he says, 99% of the deals we see are scams. And I laughed. And, I, and, I, and we we're talking about it. And basically, I, I couldn't tell if he was absolutely serious. But in, in hindsight, maybe he really was serious. But you know, th that, that was just something that uh, was true. There were a lot of pump and dumps and people thinking, hey, mm -hmm. we give a coin offering and some idiots are going to buy the stuff and overpay for it. And then we're all going to sell it without everybody knowing we're selling it. You know, it's just... Yeah, it was all terrible, and that's that, that's one of the one of the reasons why the crypto crash happened. So, well, yeah, I yeah, mean, like on that, I, I would like to add that um, if you you zoom out a bit, like uh, we have these these very early days when there were no games, as, as Trip was pointing out, and then all of a sudden games appeared, and guess what? People say about games like they are really bad for you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Uh, uh, at that point, games were went from zero to about 40 billion in, 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 in about uh, 20 years or so in terms of market. Mm -hmm. Then all of the sudden, free-to-play games came, came, to, came to be. And guess what <laughs> people say about games like Farmville, etc. That's what games, that's really bad. That's the worst thing you can do. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and guess what? Uh, today, last year, I think it's about 210 billion or so, a bit more. Um, that's the size of the games industry with free-to-play games. And that is with just like uh, like uh, you get about two percent payers because it's free to play. Uh, if you get about ten percent of the cohort of players that that pay and pay about about in, in five different pay games, they end up with two percent per game. Yeah. All, all the all the all the progression there was about engagement because we were selling time with with all this. So we had to create games that engage people for a long time so they could buy time. And then guess what happened next? Like. We have these new games. Uh, uh, <laughs> and guess what people, people say? It's like, that's never going to work. And, and, and guess what? People uh, are in the forecast, we foresee that the games industry in the next uh, 10 years is going to be way below, uh, above uh, 600 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, today, 85% of the games market is free to play. Uh, let's see what, what, what happens in 10 years' time about web free gaming. I fully understand. Well People see the scams, but uh, I, I also believe there are reasons to change uh, all of this. Well, actually, it's funny you guys mentioned that because, you know, currently, like the global games market is actually in terms of revenue, it's a lot bigger than Hollywood and the overall music industry combined. So like, did you guys in the past, like when you guys got started, like you mentioned it now, it's like over $200 billion in terms of, you know, the value of the gaming industry, but that's more than Hollywood movies and the music industry, which are two of the large, it's probably, it's the most dominating in terms of all entertainment industry, like the entire entertainment industry and gaming is better than, is making more than Hollywood and the music industry combined. That to me is, it just, it blows my mind. Did you guys ever think that this is something that could happen? I mean, Trip, you have been talking about trying to, you know, create a game since before that was even like an option. Like you decided to put in all these images into a, into a box, which was the computer. And, and Manel, you were a part of this free to play movement from the very beginning. Like, did you ever believe that this was gonna be the case? You know, I can't say that I, I knew 
that it would be this big or that it would be, you know, the largest, you know, media category. But mm -hmm. there is a fundamental principle here, which is that games are interactive. And there's mm -hmm. just no question about the human species. We are built to interact. You know, we're, we're not intended to be passive like a rock or a tree. You know, you know we, we thrive when we're interacting. We also especially thrive when we're social. So, you know, you think about games, you know, for quite a long time, it was just a hardcore games that were very difficult to play on platforms that were hard to even understand how to operate. You know, uh, you know we would get customer service calls and sometimes we have to start with asking people if they had were sure their machine was plugged into an outlet, you know, and had electricity. And sometimes that was the problem. I mean, uh, people have always struggled to use computers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's taken a long time to make them easy enough for uh, for humans to use. And, you know, and we prefer to be we prefer to be interacting. That's just the way we are. So it's, so it's not really shocking uh, that it's, uh, you know, worked out this way. And, uh, you know, you, again, you think about the fascination with the metaverse. It's because it's an interactive place. You know, so, uh, you know, Neil Stevenson invented that term. He wrote about it in Snow Crash 30 years ago. And we all read that book and we thought, yeah, that's what we want to be able to do. And we're still trying to figure out how to how to get it, get there. And but you can just tell that uh, with th you know, things like NFTs, if the NFTs are engaging and there are different ways you can play with them, you can craft them, you can upgrade them. You know, basically, it's like saying an NFT can be kind of like your avatar in a game like Warcraft. And you're just working on this thing and it's just getting better and better. And you're move, you know, move, moving up in, in value and in status. You know, you're really just taking ideas from the real world, like having a career <laughs> and saying, yeah, my avatar is going to have a career. And yeah, I'm going to have a life in the real world. But yeah, I'm also going to have a virtual life. And there are all kinds of market research studies now that, uh, you know, partly informed by the pandemic. I think a lot of people discovered what it's like uh, having a virtual life when you can't do all the things out in the real world that you used to be able to do. And it created some awareness around that. But there's a you know, pretty significant percentage of people that prefer their virtual life today, even though it's still in a pretty limited prototype form. You know, all, all of this stuff is going to be so much better in the next five, 10 years than it is now. And you have to realize that, you know, Minel pointed this out earlier, the average mobile game or any free-to-play game, the average free-to-play game fails to convert 98% of the players to pay mm -hmm. for it. Okay, what does that really say? That's an indictment. That's basically the public saying, this is stupid. It's not a good deal. It's not worth my money. I'm, uh, I'm not going to get my wallet out and invest money in this because it's not a good deal. There's a bunch of reasons for that. But these are the kind of problems that Web3 is designed to solve. And that's, that's why... It's such an important stepping stone to get to the metaverse. Amazing. And, and and you two being involved with games for a living, can you talk about how you guys are, you know, solving that problem? So you can maybe explain, you know, you obviously understand the way that obviously these traditional gamers think. You have the statistics, you have all the information. So what are you guys going to do to make games for a living something that's not going to give them that same impression? For sure. So let's first assess the problem we have right now. I mean, the first break was with Axie Infinity. You have two axes. You create a new one. You have created value. You can sell it. Okay. The only problem is that right. for the first two axes, you have to make a payment, and then there is this this uh, uh, mechanics that doesn't sustain in the long uh, run. So first of all, you need to um, uh, think about the the core issue right now. Many of the games you have like different categories of games. Uh, one of the categories is. Uh, you play a game, you get a token, and that token is a value that you acquire, and then you can sell it for a better price. Okay. Now, the problem you have with this approach is that uh, basically the ones that will get the most token are the ones that either pay or are the most skilled ones. Okay. Mm -hmm. What will happen is that they will have, imagine there is a group of people, these are the most skilled ones and the ones that pay the most. Now, after one iteration, guess what? They will get all the rewards, so they want to play more. But all the other ones are not having fun, so they will just give up, say, like, this is not sustainable. Uh, mm -hmm. and that's what you see in, in, in pretty much all the games in, in Web3. Now, you have a solution to that. 
in, in terms of mechanics, which is uh, you had a random reward system. So rather than going to the ones that have the most skill or the ones that pay you the most, you randomly distribute uh, the reward at a random size uh, among the different players. And that is uh, something that uh, keeps the system sustained over time. The only problem with that is that that's called gambling and that's 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 forbidden in most of the country. But we as game yeah. developers don't want to get into that. So um, any game that has this philosophy of farming a token or so will enter into those kind of issues. So that's the first mm -hmm. that, that, that uh, in terms of a solution is like, let's not use a token that works in a way that's fun, et cetera, et cetera, because that, uh, unless we want to get into gambling, which we don't, then uh, it's not possible to, to sustain in the long term. So that's one mm -hmm. first. Uh, if we have a token in our case, it's, it's more kind of a, an airline as, as a air miles, et cetera, is a, is a articulation program and world series BAP uh, status, et cetera, which is very standard. And then where you can focus on is what Trip was saying before, is these NFTs that evolve and have way more depth. Uh, I, I, I don't want to spoil a lot of what we're doing uh, so that people can play the game. I will <laughs> say that um, basically uh, think of it like, like uh, I'll, I'll put it in an abstract way. Think of it like Farmville. What was the issue with Farmville? You start with a small farm, that's fun, but then you, you start making money and then you make it grow and grow and grow and grow. There's a point where the farm is so big that it's not fun anymore. It's just like, <laughs> there's a, such a confusing game. Uh, <laughs> that, issue, that issue will resolve it at King, for example, with level-based progression. You will finish one level, then you start the next one, and everything you've done before doesn't really matter when you start the new experience. So that made uh, us, a lot, that was the beginning of games as a service. There is other approaches like the battle pass. So we are doing that same uh, thing to value creation. So when you create something, first of all, you, it's really important that games cannot be sustained in a way like you pay to start playing. Anything like that usually ends up like a, a pseudo for this game. But you have to be able to play for free, have your fun, put your time. Mm -hmm. And our principle is to say, we all humans understand that effort is, is, is worth something. So imagine that I have two NFTs, it's NFTs that just have a counter yeah. of how many people click on them. This has seven clicks, this one has 70 million clicks. You will understand that this one is worth more than the other one because of the effort. Mm -hmm. So we are using these principles to create value on the NFTs, but not only this, the problem with this then will be that, uh, I mean, when you when you take this uh, loop and you take it to infinity, you will end up with just too many, more, way more NFTs than players. So that's not fun anymore. That's mm -hmm. kind of what happened with Marvel. So we came up with this idea where with the battle pass, we create a loop that makes a, a reset to this excellent of NFTs. And that's how we keep uh, the wheel running forever. Um, but besides that, which is more on the business side, you need great games. And also, uh, to my experience, always when you have to enter a new market, and that's something that's very hard for uh, creatives, uh, you need to come up with new IP. If you think about the, all the big market changes, like uh, think about the games that made it to uh, Facebook, you have uh, City Bill, Farm Bill, uh, Millionaire City, uh, Mafia Wars, all of those were new IPs. Think about the top IPs in mobile. Like when, when, when we went to mobile, it's, it's all about new IPs. The only one that like you have, I don't know, from um, mobile business, you have from, from Fortnite to Candy Crush, uh, going through, I don't know, the ones we did, like, like uh, Bubble Witch, Papa Bear, Diamond Diga. Uh, uh, all of those are new IPs. If you take, uh, uh, if you look at those, the, uh, the only one I will say in the last change was like something like Pokemon Go, for example. That's an exception. Mm -hmm. So I think the combination of all of these, like a great game, an innovative IP, a new business model, it's what's required to uh, get a hit. I don't think no one is tackling all the all the parts. Like some people are taking IP and converting, other ones are having a token that's grander, like a, a, a float business model. Uh, other ones are not creating like in, in the core game, you need some innovation. So what we're doing with Elemental Raiders is taking a cards game that's boring and then mm -hmm. adding, adding, like rather than being a, a cards game, you actually get a character that actually has some skills and then it becomes a lot more interesting for players uh, to play around with those characters. But yeah, we could talk a lot, a lot about this, but the best is that people were able to, to play and experience that by themselves in, in a little more than, than one month from now. So looking forward to see the reaction of everyone to this. Yeah, yeah I, just want, I just want to point out that uh, if you go back to the launch of Fortnite, mm -hmm. you know, the, the industry had already progressed to a point where the most important thing to players is the social value of playing games. And the second most important thing is convenience. 
this is a big change because for decades it was more about hardware performance and trying to improve 3D models and you know frame rates and stuff like that. And uh, you know that that was really more uh, relevant to that smaller segment of the audience that uh, you know really thought of it as a hardcore hobby. But when you get to these mass markets. Generally, mass markets, yeah, you know, uh, social value and convenience, uh, those are the kind of things that rise to the top. So Fortnite comes out, and technically, it's a shooter. Your, your goal is to kill everyone, okay? That's a fairly traditional kind of game. Yeah, let's go uh, be the winner at the top of the pile after we kill everyone else. And generally, <laughs> the game is trying to kill us, and we're trying to beat the game, right? Well, uh, Fortnite actually didn't, didn't focus on that. They focused more on making it a big party. Uh, they, they gave uh, players all these fashion options about their outfit, their skin, about their weapon, what it looked like, uh, and, uh, you know, gave you these really oddball choices, like you could look like a 10-foot tall pink bunny in your weapon, <laughs> like a dolphin. You know, it's like you could do all kinds of goofy stuff. And at that time, Sony PlayStation players had never been able to play on the same map with their friends that own Xboxes. Mm -hmm. And Fortnite took off, and it's it has crossplay, and uh, so basically, suddenly there's all these uh, uh, there's all this pressure on Sony. They, hey, uh, can you let us play with our friends that are on the Xbox? And it was the first time Sony said okay, and that contributed to it being a a, a bigger phenomenon. Also, uh, because it's free to play, you know, again, Fortnite's a traditional AAA game company. They're not they they don't really have a prior history of having things be free to play, but mm -hmm. Fortnite's free to play. And so now you can go ask your friends to play with you. And it doesn't matter what screen or device they have, they can get to Fortnite. Okay, so so uh, this is like the beginning of the first meaningful prototype of the metaverse, really, is what Fortnite is. And, yeah. and uh, but here's the thing, is that Fortnite sits on walled garden platforms, including Apple, uh, and they're suing Apple about it, and on oh. PlayStation, et cetera. And Fortnite itself is a walled garden game. So if I want to buy an item in Fortnite, they don't even give me permission to trade it with other players in Fortnite. And there's no marketplace. And there's no independent marketplace outside Fortnite. So it's all is, is it's almost that what Fortnite does in managing their economy as is as bad for the public as what Apple does in managing theirs. <laughs> so this is where Web3 comes in because yeah. now we're going to say, look, when you buy that asset, you really own it and you've got agency, you've got freedom of choice about how to develop it, improve it, utilize it, play with it, engage with it, share it. And also you can go buy it in different places and ways, and you can go sell it in different places and ways. And what that does is create more competition around pricing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you, you know, you, you probably haven't thought about this, but, uh, you know, how much things cost has a lot to do with the fact that 98% of those players are not spending money. And if I put in front of you the same item, and, and I offer in one place says here, it's going to cost you $99. And over here, it's going to cost $142. That's a whopping difference. Yeah. Well, that's what, that's what a developer has to do to raise their price of everything. If they want to get the 99 cents, they've got to raise it to 142 because 30% of 142 is going to take it back down to around hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And so as a consumer, I'm looking at a 42%. It's not a 30% of the consumer. It's a 42% price hike. That's pretty enormous. So that's yeah. the first thing that dis that can discourages uh, people from spending money. And then the second thing is they, uh, at some point, they realize, wow, um, I'm tired of playing this game and I'm not going to play this game anymore. And all this stuff I bought in the game, shoot, um, if I'm not playing the game, it really uh, it has no value. <laughs> I sure. can't trans. I can't sell my account. I can't transfer my position. The uh, you know the EULAs, you know the end user licensing agreements pro prohibit players from doing that stuff. These are the kind of reasons why Web three is a big breakthrough. But don't you think that all of these little assets and all these things they're paying for in the games, they're pretty much like they're pretty much NFTs. They are NFTs, but you just can't really 
make any money off it again. Like it's just kind of like once the money's spent, it's spent. The minute there's an upgrade on this game, it's you know you can't exactly like if you're you know if you're playing Fortnite, and there's an upgrade. Um, you can't exactly take these assets into the next one. Well, to be fair, I don't, I've never played Fortnite, but I know that that's the case with a lot of the games, and that's a lot of the issues that people have had. They've said, oh, we've spent so much money on our characters in this game, but now there's a new game, you know, because every year they have to, you know, release a new one. And um, the minute that that game comes out, these assets is just kind of like money thrown. Like they've they've used it, they've played with it and whatnot, but that's it. They can't really utilize it again. And that's kind of like a lot of the times when I'm explaining NFTs, I'm like, it's pretty much like you've spent all this money on these assets in your game. And now there's an upgrade and there's a new game. You can actually take them and it's not just going to waste. You're going to be able to continue and kind of just carry on from where you left off. Yeah. You know, and by the way, uh, let's take an example like Magic the Gathering, you know, the, mm -hmm. the uh, first a uh, trading card game, you know, so it's a paper card game. Uh, th those customers are in a different situation because there is a wide open uh, aftermarket, including places like eBay, where you can buy and sell those cards. And so every Magic player, I, I know plenty of people who play Magic that have spent over $20,000 on Magic cards. And I've never in the last, you know, this is a 30 year old game. It does a billion dollars a year in business even now it's a very successful game design it has an economy that's much closer to a web through economy because basically i can do whatever i want to do with you know I'm, I'm buying the cards and i can enjoy playing with them i can trade them i can sell them and it's it's a from my point of view it's a valuable collection and there's, there's a lot of emotional attachment to various cards and memories and you know, and it and it's a again a situation where the the customer knows what they're buying and they know they have the freedom to transact with it. It's not uh, under somebody else's control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe. Like to be fair, Manel, what's what's your what's your take on this? I mean, you, <coughs> you've you know you've worked with King. Like you guys, you've personally, you know, you've released about sixty titles. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to, you know, the whole title of like these assets in game assets and uh, what is your take on it? Like, what do you, what, like, what do you make of that in the web three world? Yeah, I, 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 I agree. Like on the, on the, like, if you look at the, at the first layer of all of this is, is like this, but I just do it very clear. You take mm -hmm. Fortnite and you make the skins and NFT that will kill Fortnite's business. Okay, because those NFTs mm -hmm. don't have any of the elements that I was talking about before. At the end of the day, how Fortnite makes money is that they sell these NFTs to their players. If they can then share it uh, and sell it um, among them, the revenues will go uh, down downhill. So, <clears throat> as, as I was mentioning, like like we have this foundation, and 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 there will be a lot of evolution uh, based on this. And um, on the on the high level, the opportunity is very clear. As, as he was pointing out, if you take this two percent conversion, you just make it four percent, you will double the revenue of the whole games industry. Uh, we've seen that over and over again. Every time there is a change, what's the what 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 makes the difference is that um, it, it's what gamers want. So mm -hmm. um, at the beginning, uh, there were uh, some of the gamers that opposed to free to play games, but some liked them. Uh, and I think today we say, look, I'm, we're going to delete all the free-to-play games that are out there, from League of Legends to Fortnite, going through Candy Crush or a Clash Royale. Uh, pe people wouldn't like that. That will be like, well, why are you doing that? No? So I think uh, we're going to be evolving to, towards that direction uh, with with uh, these changes. But I think the core is, that as, as uh, people were saying about the smart contracts, is like, don't think of it as just something that you can take and trade make it deeper, add more, more depth into it so that the business model gets enriched. And then it's when, um, at the end of it, it's a, it's, a, it's a competition between all the game companies. If you, if you, if you release a, a free-to-play game that's great and it's really well designed, what's going to happen is that you're going to get enough money to promote it way more than a box product. Uh, mm -hmm. So take all the GTA uh, franchise titles or the... All the Halo uh, titles released to market today, I think it's five billion that they've made. Uh, while uh, a game like, uh, for example, Candy Crisis is is, is at, at above ten billion. So, 
um, free to play is so much better in terms of, of business that allows it to, to create a lot uh, better games. And you can see that with uh, Call of Duty Warzone, with uh, Fortnite, with League of Legends, with many of the other games. Now with uh, uh, Web3 games, I see the same. Like uh, as soon as we crack the business model, that's always the trigger. When someone cracks it and figures out a way to have a business model that generates more revenue per user than the previous one, then you have more resources and then you kind of start expanding that. And what I like it from, from this revolution is that and, and each one of the steps, there is something that I like a lot because the player is the one that, that rules this. So uh, to make it very clear, like when we had the, and, and you lift a lot of that trip, like when we lift the box model, like, like you will sell box products, mm -hmm. uh, uh, publishers didn't want to change that for free to play. And there was a very clear reason for that because they had full control of the, of the players. They choose what they had to play uh, and, and, and it was all about the franchises. So if you had the franchise, you had the right spot on the on the shelf, uh, and, and you have the right review because maybe you have even bought it. Uh, they will buy it because they, that's all they can do. That like as a consumer, as a gamer, I could just buy what was there. I could not decide which game I like or not. Now with free to play, all of a sudden now publishers have to create great games, and that that's something you like. You lose control over the business like something that will be in is very hard because it's more demanding on you and <clears throat> but that's very good for players because you can play as a person like you can enjoy the game with your friends now with web3 that becomes uh pretty much the same like all the ones that have a really good web2 business don't want to transition to web3 uh so and then the people that have been trying to do web3 games most of them are newbies to to to, to gaming uh, so they don't really understand mm -hmm. the, the nuances. It's very complex to do a free-to-play game. It's really complex. So they don't, don't understand that. And, and uh, it's a matter of time when uh, some people, like, for example, what we're trying to get for a living, will release proper products uh, that work with a very sustainable business model and will start reading that. And the other ones will be, like, really uncomfortable because they'll see this thing moving on as it happened already. Like, think if you were in the position of Activision Blizzard, how do, will you feel about King? I mean, you don't like that. So what do you do? You buy that <laughs> because yeah. I don't like to take you over uh, over over time. I mean, and you don't really understand how they've done it. Uh, so you mm -hmm. acquire them, you wear them, you do a knowledge transfer, and then you create your own uh, uh, Call of Duty war zone. You know? Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, there's an issue, uh, Dino, that you brought up earlier. I just want to uh, comment on the fact that yeah, there's this echo chamber right now where there's all this disagreement about NFTs and games. Mm -hmm. And I just want to point out that uh, there is a, I just call it the legacy part of the industry. There are legacy companies, you know, old companies like EA and Activision that uh, have these legacy brands that grew up uh, a long time ago. And they were always sold as, you know, packaged goods, boxed games. You pay up front, yeah. you know, uh, the price you pay up front over the years, it's moved from 40 to 50 to 60 to 70. But there mm -hmm. are still uh, this is still a, an, an important part of the industry. And if you look at that uh, segment of the industry back in 2008, it was the whole industry. Yeah. And today, 15 years later, the amount of revenue from that is about half of what it was 15 years ago. So it's actually a declining market and mm -hmm. it's uh, less than 20 percent of the total game industry. So it's. It's a you know it's just, it's still a decent amount of money and if, if you've got a brand like Call of Duty or Battlefield or there's various mm -hmm. others, uh, you know they, they want to get paid up front and they want to keep doing that. Now again, I talked about the social value of uh, games, and basically some of that social value is being in contact, you know, competing, uh, cooperating with your squad, you know, whatever you're doing, esports mm -hmm. and so on. But the really critical reason why humans care about social life is because we value status in social life and our status determines a whole lot of things about the outcomes of our lives. Mm -hmm. And so the legacy customers, their history is they pay up front, they never have to pay another nickel, and then they do hundreds of hours of grinding and they get to the top of the pile and they are the greatest things in sliced bread. And that, that's what they like doing and that's what they want to preserve. And so they do, they really just don't, like any of the changes in business models and platforms that have come along that move away from that. And they complain about it. You know, it's a, it was a sufficiently vocal community. But uh, 15 years ago, there were about 300 million of those gamers. And they would only spend a couple hundred bucks a year 
on their gaming hobby. And it wasn't that big an industry. It was kind of a glorified hobby industry. Today, uh, that 300 million, it hasn't really necessarily gotten that much bigger. And about half of them, guess what? They also play mobile games. They also play free to play. They're, mm -hmm. they're doing esports stuff. They're doing MMOs. They have shifted about half of them. And, and, in, and in fact, uh, that, that's an indication of the future that it will that that migration will continue. And many of those personalities, uh, because they care about their social rank, these are maybe uh, people that once upon a time they were kids playing in their uh, parents' family room. And now they're adults that maybe have a job and a spouse and a couple of kids. Well, you don't have the same amount of time to do the grinding. And that's mm -hmm. why you want to be socially connected with your friends and you want to be able to play, but you're going to have to fit it into shorter sessions and you're not going to be able to have the status unless you spend the money to build a position and, you know, pay for the season passes and buy the nice skins and do, you know, do all of these things that in fact, everybody, you know, is doing. And then mm -hmm. meanwhile, the rest of the industry has grown like crazy. But when, uh, when these uh, legacy game companies, you know, this happened to Ubisoft uh, it's happened uh you know, to, to other AAA game companies when they've made any kind of announcement about NFTs is that mm -hmm. that traditional uh, customer, the legacy customer, they don't care for it. They're worried about it. They think it threatens their way of doing things. Yeah. And it reminds me of that time about five years ago where Blizzard had a conference and there were a bunch of their fans in the audience and they announced that they were going to do a Diablo mobile game. And oh, yeah. And the crowd booed, right? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, that is just so classic. I mean, you, you know, all the legacy people are in the audience going, no, 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 no. We don't want you to be distracted by mobile. Focus on us. We're not doing mobile. Look, I'm an old enough guy that I've got gamer friends from my childhood. And these are hardcore competitors. Mm -hmm. And some of them actually don't use mobile phones. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, you how? want to talk about old people like, that haven't changed. Some of them don't use mobile phones but they're hardcore internet PC gamers and they don't want it to change. Wow. <laughs> but I remember this, didn't they like, because of the way their fans reacted, they actually ended up not going with it. Didn't they? They just, they just scratched a lot of it. Them got scared and said, wow, we got it. You know, we don't want to mess up the vibe of this thing we got going. But, but to be fair, I also get stuck. it. Yeah, I also get sure. it because like the actual, like gaming, the gamer community itself, like we've seen what happened with GameStop. Like, these guys have power. Like everyone can say whatever they want about them. There is such a strong, and like the thing is, it's because of, like you mentioned, it's about like having that community, that social side of things when you're gaming with people. It's, they have such a strong bond. Like there's such a strong connection between gamers in where in any community that they're hanging out at, like Discord or Reddit, like these guys have a strong bond and they are powerful because if they want to decide to like become a mob and come for something like let's say with the Diablo incident like they'll do it and they've succeeded so why wouldn't they you know come for them like they it's it, it, they've been with them from the start as well so they obviously feel like entitled to have that opinion and I think as there's two sides to the reaction so with Diablo saying okay we're going to listen to the community it's kind of giving the community that almost like that DAO you know, if we want to make it into a crypto thing, it's like a DAO. It's like they said no, so it's a no. But at the same time, it's like, well, they were too scared to try because of that. But anyways, yeah, that's you just know, the power I, of I the gaming community. Put the finishing touch on what you just said. Yeah. Uh, disruptive products. That was a term coined by Clayton Christensen, mm -hmm. uh, who is the uh, you know Harvard researcher that kind of figured out how uh, to describe how disruption works. One of the things, you know, he studied lots of, he and his team studied lots of different industries and a pattern they saw everywhere is that big companies get disrupted. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons they get disrupted is they are listening too much to their legacy customers. And that just yeah. keeps them in that little box. Wow. Well, so, you know, if you, want, if you want to figure out sure. who's going to lead in Web3, who's going to lead in the metaverse, I can guarantee you it's not going to be some of the big name legacy companies because they didn't lead when the internet came along. They didn't lead when mobile came along. They didn't lead when free to play came along. They didn't lead when Facebook uh, social games came along. They're not mm -hmm. leading now in web three. I mean, this is just the way it is. 
Anyway, we're well, excited to have the opportunity to lead. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to see it. I'm, I'm enjoying working with you guys. I'm very grateful to have had you here today. So I just want to say thank you both, both so much. Thank you so much, Trip Hawkins. And thank you so much, Manel Sort. It's been a pleasure mm -hmm. speaking with you both today. Um, so thank you. So thank you for being here. And thank you, Entrepreneur, for, for hosting us. Likewise. Today. Thank you.